Welcome, everyone, uh, once again to East Coast International Church. Those of you joining us online, welcome. Uh, I am excited to be here and uh, see each and every one of you, and uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity uh, to bring uh, the Word of God uh, this morning. Are you guys ready? Yes? All right. All right. That didn't sound too convincing. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. All right. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So we're going to jump in, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about strategy. Can you say strategy? Think of all the ways in which strategy plays a part in our everyday lives in ways that we don't even really can identify most of the time. Uh, think, for example, when you go to the grocery store. Have you ever noticed where they put the milk and the eggs all the time, all the way at the end of the uh, grocery store? And the reason is they want you walking through the entire store to get there. And as you're walking, you're like, oh, yeah, I need bread. Oh, yeah, I need uh, toilet paper. Oh, yeah, and you start thinking about all these things and you start spending more money, right? Have you ever noticed how they put the candy right next to the cash register, right? They know what kid wants. You know, they know what you want. It is a strategic decision to put it there, right? Somebody thought through the process of putting it there. Think for a moment about a, a presidential candidates. At most a political campaigns have at least one or two or sometimes even a team of people who strategize on uh, how to uh, touch on a certain hot topic issues and how to promote the candidate uh, during the election. And uh, so there's a strategy in place. And I want you to notice, too, uh, some of the commercials. You know, the, the Super Bowl is coming up, so there's a lot going on, and you're starting to see some of the, some of the teasers. But, uh, you know, recently, a while back, I started seeing a lot of cute little commercials, a lot of little... Uh, daddy and uh, daughter commercials. I don't know why. It's, it's, it's the strangest thing. But I started seeing them over and over, and I'm like, this is strange. Um, but it's because, uh, you know, they're selling you this idea in these commercials, hey, if, if you really love your daughter, you will buy this brand of diapers or whatever it is that they're selling you, right? And that's because Google knows you better than you know yourself. They know your spending habits. They know what you're looking at. They know what you're searching up. I mean, they've got you pinned, and they have a strategy of getting every last cent out of you. Can I get an amen, right? All right? We we go through that, but it's not random. It's all by design. There is a design in place. And uh, if you're paying attention, you will notice that even in the spiritual realm or in the spiritual world, there is a strategy. Check out Ephesians 6.10 where it says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against what? All strategies of the devil. Take note of that. All strategies, meaning the devil has strategies. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, so human beings are not our enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Somebody say unseen. Unseen world against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So this is the spiritual world, and therefore, it shouldn't be a coincidence. Uh, you should not be surprised that just when you're ready to make progress in an area of your life, the enemy will set up a strategy. The enemy will send that person your way, or that temptation your way, or that sickness to derail you, or that conflict to discourage you. It is a strategy of the enemy. Just as you're ready to move forward and take your next step, in your spiritual walk, chaos will ensue. Have you noticed that? How that happens? It's, it shouldn't surprise us because it's a strategy. And so I want to talk for a moment about the reality of the spiritual world. You know, often when we think of uh, the spiritual world or spirituality, we don't immediately think of strategy. And in fact, our culture at large, we, we kind of think of it as abstract, hard to grasp. Uh, there is a camp of people that are in complete denial. They'll say, no, the spiritual a world does not exist, uh, only what we can touch and see and smell. Uh, others uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, maybe, um, you know, they, they want to believe, but they don't really believe because it's so confusing and it's so hard to understand. And, you know, uh, most of us have a pretty hard enough time dealing with the physical world we can see, right? <laughs> Going into the metaphysical world or, or what's out there, it's just, it's too much. So why don't we just pretend it doesn't exist, right? We close our eyes. Then there's another group of people that have found a way to tap into the spiritual world, but they're using it to control other people, right? So 
this is known as witchcraft, where we uh, tap into a, a spiritual power in order to control other people. And so that it may not be called witchcraft, but that's the essence. And then there's another group of people who uh, kind of live in, in, in they think of, of the spiritual world in terms of like a neutral zone where it's not super friendly, but it's also not super dangerous. Uh, it, you know, it's just kind of in between. Uh, recently, I was listening to this podcast, and this lady who, you know, sells real estate, uh, she had a special episode on haunted properties, you know, ghosts, ghosts and properties, yes. And so it was very interesting, and she went on to tell her experiences trying to communicate with the ghosts, right? And, and one house in particular, uh, she was walking through the property uh, with uh, the, the sellers, and uh, in this room, there was a piano, an old piano. And, you know, they were walking and talking, and all of a sudden, they hear the tingling of the ivory, the, 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 the piano, the piano keys. And, uh, and they're like, ooh, what could that be? And so she asked uh, them so a few questions. Come to find out, the uh, deceased grandmother used to play the piano. And so now she's trying to communicate, right? And so, and so she begins to talk about, yeah, you know, I'm, I've always been uh, an empath, and I, and I can connect. And I can talk to the other side, and 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 you know the the the, the ghost of the grandmother is approving of the sale, uh, and so all this stuff, very interesting stuff, very interesting. Uh, I gotta tell you, I learned a lot. Uh, so when it says that we are in a battle we're, that we're fighting, not against flesh and blood, we need to pay attention to that because the Bible actually teaches this idea of a warfare worldview. Somebody say warfare worldview. It's a tongue twister. Warfare worldview, right? And here's essentially what that means. It means that our human existence, right, our lives, are being lived out in the plane of a cosmic war between the forces of darkness and the forces of good, right? And when it says we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, that, that word fighting, that's the war. That's the war part. That's, that's where we're struggling. That's where uh, we are fighting each and every day. And uh, the idea is that what happens in, in the spiritual uh, world that we can't see also impacts the physical world that we can see and vice versa, right? But more on that in just a moment. But just hold on to that idea. What does Scripture tell us about our role as we face the spiritual world reality? Well, here's the bottom line. Our prayers actually matter. Our prayers actually matter. Yes. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. If we are to engage in prayer, then we need to be aware of three components. And I, I, these are the three things that I want to share with you today. So if you're taking notes, the first one is authority. Somebody say Authority. All right, as in spiritual authority. Uh, up next, I want to show you a little clip that I ran into that I thought was pretty hilarious. And this is what we often believe. Uh, this is what we think of when we think of someone who's super spiritual and, and has a lot of authority in prayer. So watch this. Joel Carpenter is a new Christian. So to help him pray, we've hired that super pastor guy you see on TV. God, please help my marriage. We're just really struggling right now. Oh, Heavenly Father, He who has created all things, makes the sun and moon rise at His command. I beseech you, take this woman that you've given to me as a helpmate and bring her to her senses that we might abide together forever in a purpose-driven marriage. God, I'm really frustrated at work. Help me find a new job. I ask you now, in this area of employment, thee who gives me the sustenance in an employer fashion, please guide me to something, if it be your will, that would bring you glory. My kids are driving me crazy, and I, I don't know what to do. You just help me out. You have blessed me also with many young saplings, and I ask at this day that you would help me and my helpmate to raise them in the way of your word. Amen, God. And now I end this time with you, Lord, bowing before you, giving you all that you deserve in sacrifice and in sacrament. Let it be known that the Alpha Omega is pleased. Amen. 
God Co. Real people, real prayers. All right, all right, all right. So the point of that is that spiritual authority has nothing to do with how loud you pray or how fancy you pray. For believers, for followers of Jesus, our authority quite simply comes from Jesus. Jesus gives us our authority. And this means that anyone can pray, by the way. You can pray. You don't have to be a deacon, a board member, a TV pastor, a bishop, and you certainly don't need to pray like one either. You can just be yourself and tell God what you need. And so spiritual authority or the power to engage in spiritual conflict without getting destroyed comes out of a relationship with God. And when we say yes to Jesus' rescue mission, we have that relationship with God. Romans 8.15 says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. So there's this closeness that we have with God. And what happens is that sometimes there are people who try to yield spiritual power without authority. And, you know, as a, a, a pastor here on staff and uh, you know, I manage some of the church's uh, properties. Uh, sometimes I am tasked with giving information or taking certain actions on behalf of the church. And, you know, when I do that, I, I'm not just representing myself in those moments, but I am representing the church at large. And so, uh, you know, I may step into a room, you know, maybe they, they think, what are you doing here, you know? Uh, but in that moment, I'm, well, I'm there on behalf of the church and, and kind of stepping in, in that, uh, under that authority. Let's take a look at an instance in the Bible of kind of a, a misuse of spiritual authority. What not to do, okay? Uh, the seven sons of Sceva, this is a classic story in the book of Acts 19. This a group of people who are uh, trying to uh, use Jesus' power without a true relationship with Jesus. Watch what happens. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying... I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time, when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. <laughs> so <laughs> what we learn from this story is that in order to make use of Jesus' authority, we need to actually be walking under Jesus' authority. Because if we don't, then it could be really, really dangerous. You see, these people, they knew of Jesus, but they didn't actually know Jesus. And, and that was revealed in that moment. They were trying to manipulate Jesus to get what they wanted. And so that's a, that's a misuse of authority. Um, but in the Bible, we also find proper uses of authority. Uh, go back to the Old Testament for a moment. There's a story about Elijah. Elijah, great man of God, and he has this uh, young um, assistant, a servant, uh, and there comes a moment where they find themselves surrounded by a large army that is about to invade, and they have nowhere to go. Have you ever felt overwhelmed in your life where uh, you felt overwhelmed, outnumbered, surrounded uh, by all these difficulties from all sides? Well, that's where they were, and they had nowhere to go, and they were outnumbered, and they were outgunned, and they were outplanned, or so the army thought. And so this uh, young assistant, he starts freaking out. We're surrounded. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And Elijah keeps his cool, and watch what he does in, in, in 2 Kings 6. It says, then Elijah prayed. That's really what we should do in these moments. Then Elijah prayed, oh, Lord, Open his eyes and let him see. All right, so this is a spiritual sight that he's talking about. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elijah was filled with horses and chariots of fire. All right, so heaven's big guns are coming out. And, you know, as the Aramean army advanced towards him, Elijah prayed, Oh Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness as Elijah had asked. So get this, in the natural, they are surrounded. There's no way they can win. But in the spiritual world, it is the Aramean army that is actually outnumbered because God is with him. 
And this is uh, true of all of us, that sometimes we may feel surrounded, but God is actually on our side. God is fighting for us. And so how was Elisha able to stand his ground in the face of overwhelming attack? Well, the key is found in, in the, the verses uh, leading up to this moment. We, when, we, when you get home, I, I encourage you to read the story. It's hilarious. But uh, basically, we find out that Elijah was a man who was constantly yielding to the voice of God. And God was giving him strategy to outsmart the enemy. And so, you know, the enemy was coming this way, and, and, and God was telling him, go this way. And so he, he was uh, one-upping the enemy, and that's what happens when we pray, by the way. And so he, he was a man under authority, and in relationship with God, he was constantly communicating with God. And I want to ask you today... Are you walking under the authority of Jesus in your life? Are you walking in the authority of Jesus in your life? Have you made a decision to accept God's forgiveness and leadership in your life and in every area of your life? Because when we are under the authority of Jesus, we can then live a life of prayer and we can stand confidently in the face of opposition. We can stand our ground. We can be bold when we stand under the authority of Jesus. So authority. Number two, we need alignment. Somebody say alignment. I want to talk about one of the worst experiences a person could be subjected to. Boston traffic, right? Have you ever had to go into Boston for a hospital visit or something important, right? And, and what, do you, what do you find? You'll find all kinds of obstacles in your way, right? From uh, someone uh, hitting their brakes right in front of you, right? No blinkers. You know, maybe there's a detour or a tunnel shut down. People with unusual uh, road rage. None of you in this room, of course. Uh, maybe an accident or a flat tire clogging up a flow of traffic. Uh, there is so much uh, out of control, right? So, so many things out of your control uh, when you're driving, but you still have to do your part. You can't just pull over on the side of the road and, and, and sit there. You have to get to where you're going. You have to drive your car through that maze. And so a prayer is a lot like that. Prayer is very uh, complex because there are many factors at play. There are many uh, things that cross purposes of each other. And so uh, let me give you some examples. Number one, as we're praying, as you're praying, uh, we have God's will. Somebody say God's will. God's will. God's will is what God wants to see happening in our lives. Good things, blessings, all these things. But then we also have human will, right? We have what every individual human chooses to do. You see, the Bible teaches that God's will can actually be opposed. So just because God wants something to happen doesn't mean that it will happen. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 7, verse 30, it says this. But the Pharisees and experts in religious law rejected, somebody say rejected, God's plan for them, for they had refused John's baptism. So get this, God has a good plan for them, a good plan for their lives. And their response is, no, thank you. We're all set. And so God's will is opposed. And you might ask yourself, how can this be? How can it be that, that, that God's will can be opposed in my life? Well, you see, friends, the Bible teaches that God is love. And real love, in order for it to be genuine love, it has to be freely chosen. You have to choose it willingly and freely. It can't be coerced. God cannot make you do anything. God cannot make you obey. God cannot make you respond to him. He can help you, but he's not going to make you do it. There is an element of free will, free choice, that we have to participate in the process. I want to ask you a question, and as you look at your life, as you look at this world, as messed up as it is, how often do you think that God is actually getting his way on the earth in your life? How often do you think God is actually getting his way? Because the Bible teaches and reality teaches us that God doesn't always get his way. Turn on the TV for two seconds, and you will see war, famine, violence, sickness, death, right, suffering, children, that is not the will of God. That is not the will of God, and yet it happens because people often 
can, or always can, and often do, uh, reject the will of God. God wants peace. God wants love. Uh, but human beings, we, we have a free will. And if that wasn't confusing enough, there's another element in the mix, which is rebel spirits. Somebody say rebel spirits. These are fallen angels. You got your, your demons, your evil spirits, your unclean spirits. They're all uh, these uh, demons that are at war. They are fighting against, constantly against the will of God. And you might be like, where is that in the Bible? Well, one uh, classic uh, passage is uh, in, in Daniel, the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel. He's been praying for 21 days. You know, he's the original Daniel fast, you know, praying guy. That's the guy. Uh, so he's, he's doing the 21 days uh, of uh, prayer and fasting. Um, but he's not hearing anything from God. Have you ever been there? You're, you're, you're just praying and nothing's happening. You're not hearing anything. And on the 21st day, an angel shows up with the answer to Daniel's prayer, and he tells Daniel why he took so long. And watch what happens in Daniel 10. The angel told him, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But watch this. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. The spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So this is an evil uh, demon, a ruler, authority over a geographical location. He blocked his way. And then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. And I left him there uh, with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So this is like crazy, right? All these, all these things are happening. And all Daniel knows is, I'm not hearing anything from God. A great encouragement, by the way, this story of just keep on praying. Just keep on praying. Just keep on praying. But what's happening here, what we're seeing is these free-willed fallen angels that can directly and strategically oppose the will of God. That's why life is hard. That's why you have all these struggles each and every day. Uh, we wrestle with different things, and that is why. And so we come to the point now where we have to ask ourselves, so what are we going to do about it? All right? If this is the reality of the spiritual world, what are we going to do? Well, here's what we're going to do. We are going to do our job. Amen. All right? We do our job. Tell your neighbor, do your job. Do your job. No, but say like you mean it. Do your job. Do your okay? In honor of uh, the great late uh, Bill Belichick, you know, may he rest in peace. I know he's not dead, but he's no longer with us. He's moved on uh, to uh, greener pastures. But we do our part. We do our job because our prayers actually matter. Your prayers, the prayers that you've been praying, they actually matter. You see, somehow, in a way we don't fully understand, God partners with us through our prayers. And our prayer helps more of God's will to be done on the earth than if we didn't pray. I'm going to say that one more time. Somehow, in a way we don't fully understand, God partners with us through prayer, and our prayer helps more of God's will to be done on the earth than if we chose not to pray. Amen. So we need to pray. If, if you're having doubts, just pray. And here's what happens when we do pray. When we come to God and we say, God, uh, this is what we need. Phil Philippians 4, 6, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So notice this. There is a sense that when we get alone with God and we bring our burdens before him and you know, we, we spend some time praying and asking that we leave our worries and anxieties at the feet of Jesus. We don't bring them with us. We lay them down, and we experience this peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what happens when we pray. And so even if the problem is still there after prayer, we, we have the peace of God. That, God, I know you're working. That, God, I know you're with me. God, I know that you are fighting my battles, and we say it in faith because that is actually what's happened. So we bring, we entrust God with our needs. And so what happens once we pray? Okay, so I've prayed now. Uh, and usually what we expect is to see 
God doing miracles, right? Uh, there's, there's this response to prayer that, you know, uh, I call it watch this, you know, like, like when God says watch this and he goes to work and there's a miracle. Have you ever seen God work in your life in a way that you can't explain it and it's just like, whoa, like God, you're really uh, showing off in my life? And that's usually the kind of response that we expect from God when we pray. And by the way, we should. When you pray, you should pray with boldness. You should pray with faith. You should pray as if you're actually expecting God to do something in your life. And so, so that's one answer to prayer. But on the other hand, we must also mature in our understanding of what prayer is. Because, friends, let me tell you, in case you didn't know, prayer is not a formula. As the seven sons of Sceva found out, prayer is not a formula. And the end, end goal of prayer is not to get what we want. The end goal of prayer is to know God and have the character of Jesus developed in us through a life of obedience. As we learn to obey God, we're having the character of Jesus developed in us. And so, uh, you know, currently with uh, my, my daughter, Anna Jael, we're, we're currently um, in the toddler stage where we're teaching her boundaries, we're teaching her that there's appropriate times for certain things, right? Like when, when my daughter wants a banana, guess when she wants it? Right now. I want that right now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a lollipop, which she calls a pop pop, you know, she wants it right now. Right? She, she doesn't understand yet the concept of waiting. And so uh, she wants it right away. Or sometimes when I get home, I'm, I'm tired after work, and she jumps into my arms only to point to the sweets at the top shelf. And, and she's like, you know what I want. And, uh, you know, it's all very cute. Uh, it's adorable. <clears throat> but my hope is this. My hope would be that at some point in our relationship, we would be able to go beyond the phase where we're just telling each other what to do. And that we are maturing in that relationship. You know, sometimes I just want to be able to just have some moments where we can enjoy each other's presence. Uh, I, I want us to play together. Uh, I want us to explore and discover things together. Uh, I want us to work on projects together. Uh, you, you get where I'm going, right? So, so that's why when we pray, oftentimes we will get a different response immediately uh, th th than what we're immediately hoping, right? We'll get a different response. We want something, and we'll get a different response. And here's some examples of some responses that God might give you when you pray. Number one, no. Sometimes you will pray for something that is outside the will of God, and the answer is no. And it's going to continue to be no, and it's not going to change, right? No. That is not in line with my will. And so God will say no. The second thing is uh, sometimes God will say, slow, right? You need to slow down. You need to check yourself uh, before you wreck yourself. And uh, you need to, not yet. You're not ready. We need to slow down. Uh, no, slow. And sometimes God will say, grow. Uh, like this is an area where you really need to grow. You really need to mature in this area. So God will uh, have you waiting uh, for you to grow. And sometimes he will say, go, which, which is yes. You are praying exactly what's in line with my will. Go for it, Amen. right? And, and so uh, no, slow, grow, and go. These are all uh, answers that we can hear when we pray from God. But our number one goal in prayer should be to develop a vibrant relationship with God. Amen. Because as we get to know God, we have a better understanding of what he wants done on the earth, and we can pray more and more effectively. And this is why it's so important for us to know what the will of God is. This is why we're always challenging you to do the monthly goals, to, to follow along with the scriptures, to come to Bible study, because we need to know what the will of God is so that then we can pray in accordance to that, because we can't just say, God, this is what I want, and then force God to bless it without first checking if that's actually within the will of God. And so we, we have to make sure. And when we pray, the goal is to align ourselves with what God wants to see happening and for us to ask him to do it. Remember, it doesn't matter how good what God wants is. He's not going to force it on us. We have to ask him. We have to invite. We have to pray. Yeah. And there's a crucial moment in Scripture in the life of Jesus where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is right before he's arrested and, you know, he goes uh, to the crucifixion and he prays this prayer, and watch this. This is one of the most powerful prayers that a person can pray. In Luke 22, he said, 
Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Amen. Notice. I want your will to be done, not mine. As the worship team comes up, he's obviously, Jesus is obviously referring to the horrific death that was, he was about to experience. And he's, he's asking God, God, is there any way that I don't have to go through this? And what makes this prayer so powerful is that Jesus is surrendering his will to the Father's will. He's surrendering his will. He, and he's not saying, careful with this, he's not saying, God, your will be done, whatever that will is. No, he knew exactly what the will of God was in that moment. Yeah. And it was the cross, right? And many times the challenge in, in, in us surrendering uh, our will in prayer is that we know exactly what God is calling us to do many times. But it is hard. Many times it is painful. And for Jesus, he knew he knew what the will of God was in that moment. He knew it, it was to go to the cross and die for our sin. And this leads me to the final concept I want to talk about regarding prayer. And it is one that is often overlooked, which is action. Authority, align, and action. This is the part where we don't just pray with our mouths, but we pray with our feet. We pray through our action. This is the part where we don't delay and we don't keep putting it off and we don't just talk about it, but we actually do what Jesus is asking us to do, what he's inviting us to do. Because shortly after that prayer that Jesus prayed, Jesus was arrested and he found himself like Elisha, surrounded and outnumbered. And in that moment, Jesus has this strange opportunity to pull back, to get out of the will of God. He has an opportunity because you see Peter, the hothead disciple of Jesus, he took out his sword and he tried to defend Jesus, cuts off one of the officer's ears, and he tries to stop Jesus from going to the cross. But watch what Jesus tells him in John 18. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? And then in a crazy turn of events, he then goes and he heals that guy's ear. And then he gets arrested. And then he gets pulled away to the cross. Even though in the natural, it seemed like Jesus was losing, he was actually winning. He was actually winning. And in, in the ensuing hours, he would lay down his life. He would suffer and die the death of a criminal, even though he was innocent. And for three days, he would lay in a tomb. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. And this was the result of his obedience in prayer. Colossians 2.14, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. All of those rulers and authorities we read about before, he has disarmed them. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And this is why, friends, to live in Christ is to live in victory. We get to live in the victory of Jesus because Jesus has already won. He already won on the cross. And now Jesus calls us to be his ambassadors to the rest of the world where God's rulership is not yet recognized. But we get to be a part of that. And when we pray, we, we are praying, we are, we are partnering with God in extending that rulership to other people and other homes and other families and other communities. That's what we're doing when we pray. We're inviting, literally inviting heaven to earth into every situation. So today, would you please stand with me? Would you take a moment and, and just bow your head with me? If you're here in this room and you are a follower of Jesus, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you have accepted Jesus' forgiveness and leadership over your life, if you 
are a child of God and you have access to the authority of Jesus, then today I want to invite you to align your desires with God's desires and take the actions that He is leading you to do. But if you're here today and you're not sure if you are a child of God, if you're not sure that you are living under the authority of Jesus, today would be a good day to begin and to surrender your life to Jesus. If you're like, I just don't know where to begin or what action to do, I'm inviting you today to begin taking up your spiritual arms. You see, sometimes we have to take up our spiritual arms. Jesus said, I have come to destroy the works of the enemy. And as followers of Jesus, we get to be a part of that. So I want to challenge you today to take up the spiritual arms that God has given you. To take up the weapon of prayer. To pray for your family. To pray for everyone around you. Pray like you've never prayed before. There is a battle for your life and the lives of everyone around you. And your prayers actually matter. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to sing this song. And as we do, we're going to open up the altars. If you need to come and pray, we're going to invite you to do that at this time. Come and pray. Come surrender your life to Jesus. Respond to God because your prayers matter. Your prayers matter today. Let's sing this song together.